The poor's head in hand bear I, bedecked with base and rosemary. How many people do you know who are building their home culture around seasonal harvest and feasting? Or that are hunting as you are for self sufficiency and back to the land values? Or that share your artist's passion for human scale meat craft? At farmsteadmeatsmith.com, We've created a community of hundreds of omnivores from around the world with these shared goals and two major places for them to learn from and inspire one another. First, we have our semi-annual hands-on educational event, The Family Pig, here at our Heartland Homestead in Oklahoma. Come meet Brandon, get your elbows greasy, and over the course of three days, kill, cut, cure, and cook two pigs completely. You'll rub those greasy elbows with other meatsmiths from around the country, sharing meals and conversations to inspire you for years to come. Secondly, for more remote learning, over at farmsteadmeatsmith.com, we host a purely digital membership program with an archive of film and textual resources five years deep now. And both our on-site classes and online program Include access to our most unique and rewarding private community Facebook page, Meatsmith Table, which is the only international network by and for homesteaders harvesting animals on a domestic scale using traditional and regional methods. We've been told that our classes are life-changing and the membership program unparalleled in quality and quantity. To get a taste of our education, search farmsteadmeatsmith.com and our YouTube channel for our free films, conversations, and downloads. Explore how we and other meatsmiths across the globe may best come alongside you and support you in building your home around the harvest. Please head to farmsteadmeatsmith.com today. to be here and to also be in the middle of the country. I, I did bring some show and tell today. Uh, these are items from the flesh of a pig, all of which I raised in Washington State where we lived as of October before our flight. And uh, these represent what we raised on our land, just a little two and a half acres in the forest of evergreen conifer trees on a little island in the Puget Sound. And I shoved all of these in the back of my box truck and uh, flew down to Oklahoma with relative haste, a good deal of haste indeed. And uh, we brought it all. And I wanted to tell you about a little bit of how we We provision our home because there is something about creating and and producing and actually limiting yourself to the food that we create ourselves that is very Lenten. And it actually has in it built in a degree of detachment that I think is obfuscated or at least made more difficult in a culture where we regard food as a thing that is consumed by virtue of our likes and dislikes, rather than food as a thing that we consume as a gift from God. And that's that's what we say when we say grace before our meal. And that just becomes that much more apparent when you raise your food and you grow it And then you dare to take its life and feed it to your children. And we live in a bizarre time right now, I think, unprecedented in history, where the easy route, the easy path is to purchase food. That's actually the simple way. That is the easy way to acquire our nourishment. And this, I think this is pretty unprecedented such that to actually raise your own meat, to grow a pig in your backyard, to grow some sheep, whatever your land can support, is quite a radical act. And, and then to, on top of that, limit yourself to consuming that product. 
to consuming what you produce. And it was so wonderful to hear fathers talk on, on fasting. And I think that I was reminded as he was speaking of, of fasting, of the good, the positive good that is a willful limitation that you place upon yourself. Because that's what we would actually have to do. If you're going to eat what you grow, what you produce, you have to create an artificial limit and say, I'm not going to purchase this. Instead, I'm going to grow it. I'm going to receive my food rather than go out and acquire it for the price of money. And that is that, that willfully adopted limitation, I think, is full of fruit. And I'm an English major, for good or ill. And I, uh, I'm a convert to the Catholic faith. I grew up in a, a, a well-ordered Protestant home. And I went to a Protestant university where uh, I made the mistake of actually reading Calvin and Luther. Um, which was something that my, 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 my friends in the theology department did not do, but I was an English major, so we, we read literature, we read Calvin and Luther, and um, it was very much a, an eye-opening experience, and for me and my wife Lauren, uh, our, our conversion to the Catholic faith was simultaneous with our I guess you could say ancestral return to the land, to growing and producing our own food. And as an English major, I learned about sonnets. I learned a lot about sonnets. I read a lot of sonnets. And a sonnet is a glorious form of poetry. It is a 14-line poem. It is very short, and it is very rigid, extremely rigid. Not only is the rhyming scheme prescribed, you must have an A, B, B, A, A, B, B rhyming scheme, and then you must end it in four lines. It's either two couplets um, or, or another A, B, B, A. And so it's, it's very prescribed. It's very limited. Not only is the rhyming scheme limited, but the, I promise sonnets have to do with pigs. They are related. Uh, the, uh, the line length is delimited by how many beats there are per line. And the nature of those beats, they have to be iambic beats. So you have to have a, an emphasis as the secondary rhythm to each syllable. Um, and if you're Shakespeare, you can write a sonnet and, and you even thematically you are constrained. Sonnet means room. It is a room. It's got walls and a ceiling and a floor. It is a, it is a boundary. It is a border. And if you're Shakespeare, you can follow the theme of a sonnet, and the theme of a sonnet is to establish a conflict and then resolve it in the last four lines. If you're Shakespeare, you can do that in two lines. Um, and what you find is if you ever endeavor to write a sonnet, if you endeavor to force yourself into that room, into that structure, and you follow the exact rhythm per line, the exact rhyming scheme, the exact themed content of it, you're not writing free verse, right? Free verse is just this um, unrestrained, unrestricted, I would say, reprehensible, appetitive vomiting upon a page. <laughs> Unworthy of poetry. But if you force yourself into a sonnet, into a structure that has limits, you create poetry that you did not know was in you because the structure elevates you beyond your mere conceits, your mere ideas. It's limitation. And you will stand back and you'll read your sonnet and you'll think, I, I didn't know that I knew that. I didn't know I could write that because the structure has elevated you, that denial. And that is what my family has experienced in raising our food, as, as much as we can. Um, we, we raise pigs, we, we get all of our eggs from our own poultry, and we, we slaughter all of them ourselves. We do, we do the killing, the cutting, and the curing all in-house. 
and we impose, and it is an artificial, it's a manufactured limit that we impose upon ourselves such that we don't rely on purchasing meat for our family. Um, I have to bracket off the last, since October, since we moved, when we ate all of our meat in Washington State and then left. Uh, we killed all of our animals there and ate them all. And so now we, we, we're, we're building the farm back up again, so I'm undergoing the very strange experience of purchasing meat again uh, in Oklahoma. And nothing has uh, done more to convince me that we lose so much if you are limited to the meat and the produce that you, that you purchase. It's, it's, it's truly amazing. I would say that the, the ham that you grow, harvest and cure yourself, it's not just different from the ham in the supermarket by, by degree, but in kind. It is, it is another thing entirely. And I hope that that is a, a slightly apparent to you. I brought some carved here for you to try. Um, and I'll, I'll keep doing that as we go. Um, but I was going to talk about the, the virtue of killing pigs. And to kill a pig nicely, there's actually a wonderful source on this. And I think everyone here is familiar with that. And that is William Cobbett, who's already been mentioned. He wrote an excellent guide called Cottage Economy. And that is just the first two words of the title. The title is actually about two paragraphs long. Um, because William Cobbett is unrestrained in his confidence in his opinions, and they just <laughs> flow. It's beautiful. Um, this is a wonderful read. Um, if, if you would like to hear a polemic against the drinking of tea, this is your book. Um, indeed, not just a polemic against tea, but for beer in its stead, and for drinking beer in the home, explicitly. So this is actually a guide written in the middle of the 19th century pertaining to containing information relative to the brewing of beer, the making of bread, the keeping of cows, pigs, bees, ewes, goats, poultry, and rabbits. So essentially, this is a guide for a pre-industrial age of making your own bacon, bread, and beer. So that's all the things. That's all you need. <laughs> and it's, it's even, even dairy, even your, I, I, I can't forget cheese. Of course, there's cheese in there. Making your own dairy, making your own cheese, all on your 40 rods of ground. He's raising feed for all of these creatures. And he actually wrote this book to cottagers who are not necessarily land-owning um, citizens who, who had available to them lots of resources, they also had a day job. They had to go to work. And yet, he is writing this guide and this encouragement to them to make their own, to grow their own barley, to make their own beer, to make their own bread, their own bacon, and their own cheese by keeping a cow uh, outside of their normal job. So it's, it's actually very pertinent um, to, our, to our situation, I think. And William Cobbett speaks of the art of killing a pig because the assumption is, is that you are going to be doing this all on your own, which will also be my assumption from here on out. So I'll speak in uh, terms that assume you will be butchering a pig on your dining room table in the recent future because uh, that, that is what you should do. So William Cobbett, of all the animals that we harvest for food, the pig is actually quite challenging. It's difficult. Um, we have the benefit of firearms, so we can use guns to dispatch animals to kill them. And the thing about slaughtering creatures in a way that does not demand excessive coercion of them, in a way that is artful and not wasteful, is that you have to be responsive to their nature. So you actually have to believe that they have a, a substantial form, that they have a nature that is that you can perceive with your senses and you can understand how a pig do, how a pig is, what it does, its nature. And that, that is not just a, you know, a poetic conceit that is 
absolutely essential. Because as any of you who would know, who have gone to kill a pig for food, if things go poorly, there is no middle ground. There is no, it goes very badly. <laughs> and so it is, it is of utmost practical significance that you take note of its nature and how the pig is put together so that you can unknit it. Because there is an order to the way a pig is put together. There is an order to the way a sheep is put together. And the craft of butchery, of curing, is unknitting that whole, continuous, ordered quilt, so to speak. You are unknitting an order. Yes, you can rely on machines to turn things into uh, varying degrees of lean meat paste. But this is below the dignity of a human creature, which we will talk more about. But William Cobbett says that to kill a hog nicely is so much of a profession that it is better to pay a shilling for having it done than to stab and hack and tear the carcass about. And if you've ever endeavored to harvest a pig before, you know the kind of situation he's referring to when he says stab and hack and tear the carcass about. That is what results frequently. And so when I, as, a, as my business, I travel from farm to farm and I harvest pigs, including my own. And it is, utmostly, it is, it is utmost importance that I discern the nature of the pigs. And pigs actually have, along with all other creatures, they have an order in their society. They have a nature, and the thing about all of these creatures that we brazenly eat, that we dare to kill, is that they have a hierarchy, and they never break the rules. They never break them. They never violate their own nature. A pig will always act in a pig-like way, always. If we ever are to force a creature to act in a way that does not accord with its nature, it is, it is us forcing it. It is a result of our imposition upon that creature. And it is usually mediated by excessive technology. So we can, make, we can stop a pig from rooting, from plunging its snout into the earth and deriving its sustenance by putting it on concrete and steel and living over you know, a lagoon of its own waste. That is not the natural order of a pig. That's not how it was designed. Um, and so when I come to a farm to harvest a pig, it is absolutely essential to the virtue of pig killing or any animal that you discern its nature. So pigs have a hierarchy. They have an alpha, and then they go all the way down the alphabet. If you have 10 pigs, you have the lead pig, you have the boss pig, and then you have number two pig, number three, number four, number five, number, all the way down. And they never break the rules. And you can witness this hierarchy, it is discernible in food rights, just as it was established on their, the order in which they suckled the sow, the pig closest to the head, is going to be the fastest growing and likely most dominant pig. And then you will see that in a sounder, which is the name of a group of pigs. You will see that in a sounder of pigs, and it is food rights. So the most brazen pig is the loudest one. That is the one that's fighting for its right to the food bowl when you come and you feed it. Um, that is usually the largest one, but this is not the boss pig because pigs do not follow belligerent leaders. They follow the best pig. And the best pig has exclusive rights uncontested to the food bowl. And when you come to harvest your pigs, you want to shoot that pig last because the pig at the top of the hierarchy is comfortable with solitude because at the top it's already alone. It's the lead pig. If you choose the pig that's at the bottom of the hierarchy uh, as the last pig to slaughter that day, that pig will be testing the fences and will be trying to get out. It'll be vocalizing because pigs, like all of these animals, um, for whom the family group is utterly essential, they do not actually fear death, they fear separation. Separation from the herd means death. So you always want to kill your animals 
when you kill your animals in the presence of the herd. We tend to drastically underestimate, um, well, we overestimate uh, the, the humanity of our livestock and we underestimate their intelligence. In fact, that's a very human word, not intelligence, their, their mental ability, such that if you anthropomorphize them and you try to separate a pig from the group, number one, that might be impossible. That might be a physically impossible act to take a 300 pound animal and put it over here so the others can't see that one die. They're cool with that. They're fine with that. <laughs> Indeed, after you kill that pig, they will rush to consume its blood because they are very practical. And they will also readjust their, the, their hegemony, the order in their hierarchy. Position three has been vacated, so four and five are gonna have to duel it out and you'll have fighting in the sounder. And all of this is of intensely practical significance when you come to harvest your pig because the pig that is the easiest to shoot is the dominant pig. Yes, I have overthought this way too much. <laughs> But this pig will walk right up to you, right when you pull up in your slaughter truck, and you'll have your rifle in your hand. He'll walk right up and give you a perfect target. He'll hold perfectly still, and that's because that's the dominant pig. And he is checking you out. Who are you? How are you doing? Are you safe? Can we trust you? And don't shoot that pig, because he's going to do that at the end of the day. Whereas if you... Uh, shoot that pig, the less dominant pigs, they, have, they are utterly insecure alone, such that if you have a pig that is lower on the hegemony and it's alone, it can stop eating. It will try to leave, it will try to get out because separation for a pig and for a lamb, the surprise across the board, is death for these creatures. Separation from the family group is death. Um, so, so much of harvesting your own meat is discerning the nature of the animal, which means we have to actually fall back. This is why um, I left academia, because it doesn't work on the farm at all. Um, when you work on the farm, you find that all knowledge comes through the senses, which is this basic principle. And I feel like if we just knew that, we would not presume ourselves to be so free to make up reality. And that is a great boundary to our hubris, to create things that we wish were, but simply are not. And pigs and raising livestock is a great way to do that. It also means that you actually have to have a, a degree of faith in that fact that all knowledge comes through the senses. So if you perceive a habit in a creature, you are indeed perceiving it. It is true. And you are actually equipped to use that knowledge to harvest that animal properly and without waste. Um, so this is, I think, what it means to harvest a pig nicely in William Cobbett's words. And the next, the, the whole point of harvesting a pig and to, to do any of this is for the very basic and, and, and simple good, natural good of supplying your material needs. You need to sustain your body so that you can love God, <laughs> so that you can sustain your spiritual duties. And... When you realize the ends, the final cause of harvesting your meat, then everything lines up below that. And it actually becomes intelligible. One thing that the industrialized scale and the centralizing of our livestock harvesting and production has done is that it has fragmented the craft. It has fragmented the virtue of pig killing. It has fragmented the art, such that we think it is many isolated actions completed by varying professionals that are highly specialized in their, in their realm. But this is actually the prowess of the home kitchen. If you look to um, the European peasant kitchen, 
this is what the housewife makes. So the way a slaughter would go, like William Cobbett says, is that it's, it's tricky enough to kill a pig that you're going to want to pick one person that's pretty good at that. And one such example would be John Howard. John Howard was a man who had the virtue of pig killing. He had the habit of pig killing. And he was good at it. He could also mend watches, and he was a good dancer. So he was a pretty important guy in the village. And come Saint, the Feast of St. Andrew, November 30th, when it's a refrigerator outside in the northern hemisphere, you would start killing your pigs. And in this particular village, John Howard was the guy that did that every year. And he would come in, and he was so artful in his, in his method, and this is a method actually we still use today to restrain large sows, he could go in, he would first get on good terms with the pig. Because these are family pigs. These are pigs that are raised in the backyard in a sty, and they're fed by the family's food waste. And in fact, the pig was such an essential part of the, again, non-land-owning family, peasant family, that it was considered rude to not ask after the pig when you visited. How's the pig? <laughs> How's the pig? Because the pig was how you survived the winter. All of this, our, our most refined and complex products of charcuterie or cured pork are winter survival food. This is how we survive quite well in the winter, is on the produce of our pig. And so you would ask after the pig when you visited your neighbors. And so these are family pigs. John Howard would come, and he would tie a noose, a rope, around the top of the snout of the pig after a good belly rub. Pigs love belly rubs. And he would tie a noose around it. And this is a, a, a method that you'll see veterinarians use today. You can restrain, you know, a 600, 800 pound animal with a rope around its snout because it, it's very weird. It's a strange feeling and they'll just pull back on it. They'll just sit back and pull. And so he would get on good turns with the pig. He would tie a noose around its snout. He would walk um, out of the pigsty to where the drain was and he would tie the rope to a brace or a peg in the framing so that the pig's head is elevated. And then he could kneel on the ground. He would put a little straw down there first because he probably only has one pair of trousers. But you kneel on the ground and then he would just stick the pig. And the pig would bleed out with a relative degree of calmness. And they would capture that blood because that is actually the first harvest. It is the living blood of the pig. And so when you go to kill your pig, um, unless you have the highly advanced virtue of John Howard and you're able to kill a pig with just a blade, you would use a rifle. And this accords with the nature of a pig, I think, because they are so intensely cerebral. It is the most humane to take out their central computing unit, to take out the brain. And if it, it is absolutely useless to shoot a pig in the head in a general sense. This will do nothing but wound the pig. And so you have to hit brain, uh, which is about that big. It's not a very big brain. It has lots of folds in it, lots of surface area. They are very intelligent. They can be house trained and everything. Um, but you need to shoot the pig in the brain. And the, the challenge of this, and this is part of the virtue of pig killing, and this goes for all the harvesting of livestock, is that you cannot, if, if you want to guarantee a miserable death for a creature, enlist a modern person who thinks they are compassionate to harvest that animal. <laughs> they are blinded by their precipitous emotion for the creature. And what happens when your intellect is blinded by your emotions? You do dumb things. <laughs> and you cannot discern the nature of the creature and what its nature requires for you to dispatch it quickly and decisively. Um, so this is frequently a challenge. And I, I remember uh, when I was learning the virtue of pig killing that I had uh, when I was starting my business. And this in particular was with chickens. I was slaughtering chickens for a lady. She had hired me to do this. It's my first job. I'm an adult now. I'm making money killing animals. And the, uh, 
when I instinctively, when I started harvesting the chickens, I grabbed them by their back legs so they're hanging upside down and brought them to an upside down, what looks like an upside down traffic cone. This is how you kill chickens. And you put them in the cone and their head comes out the bottom hole. And then you can deliver the kill. So I was holding them upside down by their feet. And the lady who raised the chickens had a disordered attachment to her chickens as pets. And so she wanted me to cradle them in my arms. <laughs> Upright. Um, this seems silly to you because you're not from the West Coast, but this is, <laughs> this is a, great, a great temptation uh, to regard. The, the thing about the, the human regard of a creature as a pet is that in a society where there are more pets than children, um, we start to think that they are children. And this clouds your intellect and your judgment. And so she wanted me to cradle them. And at the time, I didn't know how to articulate to her, no, actually, not only is this very silly, but you are wrong. This is inhumane. You are causing the chicken stress. There's this amazing effect. When you hold a chicken upside down, they stop resisting. They surrender. And so part of, you'll see, they, they just hang upside down. They're a little dizzy. They don't know what's going on. And if they fly back up, you just press their breast back down so they're hanging upside down. They're very calm in that state. But it gives the human more appetitive consolation to cradle it. <laughs> so that we aren't confronted with the burden of our own existence, which is inscribed in the blood of the animals that we eat. At least that's what I think. So... <laughs> And I found that only later could I articulate that when you hold a chicken that way, it's actually very agitated. All of its muscles are flexed. Its wing muscles are, are flexed. It is ready to flee. It does not like it. And this is a pattern that extends to all livestock slaughter. So when you perceive the nature of the creature, then you can work in accord with it rather than against it. We have the luxury of extravagant technology, of confinement shoots, of steel and concrete, whereby we can coerce the body of the creature unto its own death to fit in our technology and in the way we want to cook it. But if you are limited and you are in your backyard, which is the native climate of all, historically, of all animal slaughter, it's your backyard, uh, then you are forced to use minimal kit and you must work with the nature of the animal. And there's no, uh, one of the most apparent examples of this is when you harvest a sheep. Sheep will always think you are a wolf, always. You are a predator, unless it's a bottle-fed sheep. Yes, there's a big exception there. But you are always a wolf to a sheep. And so their response to you is flight. That is part of their nature. And so when you go to harvest a sheep, the best thing that you can do is to prevent flight. If they don't flee, then they won't panic. Their mental state, their, their degree of panic is directly related to what their body is doing. If they react in panic, they are stressed. So if you can actually grab a sheep without chasing it ever, and lay it down, and you take its life with a knife. I don't shoot sheep, you just do it with a swipe of the knife. If you lay them down properly, you can actually stand up and they'll stay down. They surrender. And this is because you have understood their nature, and you're working with, in accord with their design. And this is actually the, the art, the craft of harvesting, because it increases your yield, stress destroys the quality of the meat, and it's, it's less effort. It is far more efficient to do it this way. The other thing that is helpful to note when it comes to harvesting animals, and I teach a lot of classes. I, I host classes on, on how to harvest all manner of creatures. And I put knives in people's hands in a great uh, you know, conceit of boldness. And it turns out OK. But the. The challenge is to help people understand that reticence or timidity is no favor to the creature. 
when it comes to harvesting them. For someone that has a relationship with quadrupeds that is limited to the pet category, what you do to a sheep is going to feel very violent um, or to a pig. But that is actually what you must do for the sake of the sheep. And you actually have to, the, the, when, I, when I walk people doing this, for the f doing this for the first time, they've never done it before, I have to help them understand that when they do what feels good to them, it is no favor to the creature. It is no good for the animal at all because they are clouded by their own emotional judgment again. And so it's, it's a challenge to bifurcate that in people because when it comes to killing an animal, there's no such thing as overkill. <laughs> you want to be very decisive so that the only result is death. Um, <clears throat> especially in the case of a pig, when it comes to shooting a pig, the only thing that's harder than shooting a pig once is shooting it only twice. And any of you who have experienced that know exactly what I am talking about. If it's not a good shot the first time, any fencing that you thought you had uh, becomes totally fruitless, total, totally useless. And they will beeline at top speed for the horizon with blood gushing for their face. And it's, it's, not, it's, uh, it's not a heartwarming harvest, that's for sure. And so, when it, particularly when it comes to a pig, you actually must focus so much on your duty that you put aside your own reticence and the, your own notions that I would concede, I, I would say are a little self-flattering um, of your own harmlessness. And this is what I find in, um, I actually get a lot of vegetarians in my class where we kill animals for meat and this is what they are trying to understand. They have chosen, um, you know, much to the disappointment of Chesterton to be vegetarian because they object to the quality of the meat that is available. And they also have sort of a puritanical sense that unless they kill meat, they are not qualified to consume it, which I think is a little scrupulous. There's plenty of scrupulosity in the secular world. And uh, so to, they will frequently come to my class and, and learn how to dispatch an animal well. But they think that to legitimize it, they have to feel very deeply. Because the most authentic thing that we can do as modern people is feel authentic. <laughs> and this results in guaranteed suffering to the animal because it clouds your judgment. This is where you get, I won't get too graphic, but maybe I will. This is where you get lots of sawing motions on the necks of, of, of poor creatures who are not being dispatched quickly and decisively. Lots of excess pain. And so it is very clear that reticence, this reticence is no charity at all. Uh, when it comes down to it for our family, when we harvest an animal, you must have the means in mind, the ends in mind, because that will define the means, the final cause of all of this. And that is, if you don't have that very clearly set in your intellect, then, then you will be a slave to your appetites, to your emotions, to your notions, your, your flattering notions of harmlessness that you might like to harbor of yourself. Um, and the goal of all of this is that it is, it is a culinary act. And there are three things, three powers that all living creatures have, right, that we know from Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas. Uh, we, we have the power of growth, we have the power of reproduction, and we have the power of nourishment. And there's something incredibly unique about the way that a creature made in the image of God with the powers of the soul does those things. It is very distinct from the way we grow in a way that's distinct from grass. We reproduce in a way that is very distinct from grass. And we nourish ourselves in a way that is distinct. We have culinary arts. We actually prepare our food. 
We eat our food as if we have an immortal soul. No other creatures do this. And I know you could get a whole bunch of examples like the honey pot ants, they don't count. We, we prepare our food, we cook it, we engage in the culinary arts. And I think it's because we have a soul. And the thing about limiting yourself to the produce that you can create on your farm is that it has built into it the good of the soul. And of course, through concupiscence, we can ruin this entirely. You can raise your pig perfectly and beautifully, you can feed it well, you can kill it humanely, and you can use every ounce of it, zero waste, and go straight to hell. <laughs> so, there is, no, there is no grace in this. However, uh, <laughs> there is a good deal of, I just learned a technical theological term, which, and it's always very dangerous to use these as someone who is a non-theologian. Uh, there is the passive potency there to help you understand uh, the order of grace. It's something that grace can seize upon. And so when it comes to raising a pig, if you understand your ends, and the ends are very simple, they are mat the material good of your family. It is feeding your family. And if you, which means cooking. So the most essential bit of knowledge when it comes to harvesting any livestock is to know how to cook it. So I would sooner trust the, the butchery of my pig to a housewife who knows how to cook pork than I would to a conventional butcher at a slaughterhouse because she has the ends. The thing about butchery, the thing about slaughtering is that the thing is not about butchery. It's about cookery. It's about feeding the family. And if you know how to braise, pan, fry, and roast, if you know the three ways to prepare all of the animal flesh in the world, there are only three recipes. It's braising, pan, frying, and roasting. Then you can intuit how to do the all, all the other steps. You will be guided because you have the ends in mind. So this is always what I, uh, I try to compel people is if you stand, when you stand in front of your pig on your dining room table and you're trying to make cuts and chops and various things, you will be plagued by a feeling of cut anxiety that if you make the wrong cut, you will ruin the whole thing. This is not true. The actual reality of the situation is that if you take the shoulder of a pig and you cut it into Mickey Mouse shapes, and then you cook it and it's delicious, <laughs> then you butcher properly. That is the end. Um, and even then, I think that if you limit yourself to what you produce, there is, to a degree, a, a help, an aid against gluttony, against overindulgence there. So in my family, there is a, there's a real season for meat consumption. And it is when we harvest the pigs, that is the season when we have pork. And so there are definitely times when, uh, particularly in the winter, when we are eating bacon, served with bacon, next to bacon for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But the thing is, if you cure bacon simply, you can eat it for three weeks. So I've done it, trust me. Uh, it tastes so incredible. All of the things that you make at home will be of another order, a, a whole different category of flavor from anything that you can purchase. And so to continue with, you know, the, the virtue of pig killing and the process, we only got to the catching of the blood, so we haven't really gotten very far at all. But you capture the blood from the pig, and that is your first harvest. And you actually, as you, you use the knife to go in after the bullet, and you stick the pig so that your knife touches its spine, and then you know you've got the carotid and jugular arteries, and you'll get a stream of blood an effusion of blood flowing out of the pig, and you have to catch that in a bowl. And then you take your hand and you plunge it into the blood. And you stir the blood. You have to agitate it constantly or else it will turn into a giant scab, which is not tasty. 
And that's just because it's exposed to oxygen, and it, that's what blood do. It coagulates. And so you have to keep moving it, and the coagulating platelets will cling to your hands, and you have to whisk those off on the ground, and all the pigs will rush up the other ones, and they'll eat those coagulating platelets. They love those. You keep it stirring, and eventually, you, you know, after about eight minutes or so, you can stop when all the coagulating platelets are removed. And then you take that blood, and the best time to do this is slaughter day. Do it on the day of the kill. While everyone else is harvesting, finishing the harvest of the pig, you take that blood into your kitchen and you pretend that it is whisked eggs. The thing about blood from any creature is that it has albumin, the same protein that's in egg. So when you cook it, it becomes a pudding. It becomes solid. It doesn't melt, it becomes hard. And so m the recipe for blood sausage that we tend to follow is very French like all good French, uh, peasant Catholic recipes are. If you put it in French, it's authoritative instantly. But boudinoir, boudinoir is blood pudding, black pudding. And you mix, you, you dice up a bunch of apples and onions, and you sweat those in some pig fat, so just be, until they become translucent in a frying pan. And then you dump those into the blood, and you pour in some heavy cream, and a gluggity glug of brandy, and a couple sprinkles of salt. And then you actually have to ladle that into the same funnel that you use to put oil in your car. It's the perfect size for this. You ladle that into a funnel that has a casing, which is the intestine of a pig that you've also cleaned out on slaughter day. And you ladle it into the casing. And as it comes down into the casing, it'll fill and you tie up both sides and you poach that very gently in barely simmering water. And then you gently fry it in butter just to make the, the, the sausage casing crispy and then you serve it with toast for breakfast and peach jam. <laughs> I'm just saying you should all do that, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, that is our favorite sausage in my household, is blood sausage. Uh, and usually it was tradition, you're doing all of this when it's winter outside so you don't need a cooler. Uh, the women would take on slaughter day all of the entrails Literally, they ate every single part of the pig, everything but the squeal. And they would go down to the river. You had to go to some running water, and you would hold open the small intestine and the large intestine and the stomach. You'd rinse them all out with that flow of water. And then they would take all of the intestines, and they would actually make a sausage out of just those. It's called andouille. And you actually clean out all of the intestines, and all of the intestines, including the stomach, have a pink mucosal inner lining, just to stimulate your appetite. They have a pink mucosal inner lining. And how much of that you clean out or how much you leave will determine exactly how much skunk is in your andouille sausage. And your masculinity, uh, men, is in direct proportion to how much skunk you like in your andouille sausage. But you rinse it all out. And then uh, you tie them up, you plate it in braids, mixed with strips of bacon, of course, need not be said, mixed with slices of bacon. You make these beautiful plated or braided uh, sausages. Some of them they draw, which is kind of what andouille means, you draw lengths of intestine with strips of stomach and strips of bacon into the small intestine. And then you draw a bunch of those into the large intestine. So you have like these concentric growth rings for an andouille sausage. And then you poach it in milk at just below boiling to make all of the health inspectors very angry. <laughs> That's part of the recipe. You are not sterilizing it. Just below boiling. And then you smoke it very gently, and that's andouille sausage. And that, we haven't even touched the meat of the pig. That's just the guts and the blood. And honestly, when my family, when we harvest a pig, we have to work to eat all of the blood before it spoils. From one pig, you can get about, on a really good catch, a really good harvest of blood, you can get about three quarts of blood from a pig. That's a lot of sausage. And that is just the beginning of the yield. And then you have the rest of the carcass. And one of the things I do in my, in my work is I give people... So I slaughter the animals that other people raise, and then they come and pick up the, the cut and cured carcass from me, all wrapped and labeled. I give them 100% yield, so they get 100% of hanging weight. 
of the animals that we send to slaughterhouses, you know, the, the, the meat that appears in the grocery store, the meat that you send to any other butcher, um, they trim a minimum of 50% of hanging weight. So half at least of the carcass is considered not edible for humans and it's just disposed of. So you get a very small fraction of your creature. But if you endeavor to actually receive the entire, the entirety of the pig, you have more food than you know what to do with. It is unbelievable. It is the burden of abundance. You actually have to discipline yourself as a matter of, of again, discipline to eat it all. It becomes your duty to eat bacon. <laughs> because it is actually a challenge to eat it in its prime. That's how much more pork you will have. Yes, you can throw it all in the freezer, but the thing about the freezer is that it just delays the eventual demise of the pork. When you use traditional methods of preserving pork, so not refrigerant, not the freezer, you are actually giving the pork the ability to ripen. So it doesn't go bad, it goes good. Traditional curing of pork is it's not just flavoring, it's preservation. So you put, you take pig, the flesh of a pig, you put salt on it for a little while, and then you rinse it off, and then you hang that. And that's how you cure pork. That's all it is. It's very simple. The effect of the, of the salt is that it removes and binds water so that bacteria cannot use it to create spoilage. But you're also not locking that pork in a very slow decline into insipidity and freezer burn, you are actually allowing it to ripen. It's going to continue to break down, but not in a bacterial way. It's not spoiling. It is becoming cheesy. It's ripening. And so this is actually the craft and art of butchery and, and charcuterie, and it's, its rightful place is the home kitchen. This is where all of this was developed such that the best ham that you can purchase today, the most expensive prosciutto that exists, you know, it's something like $120 a pound, is the uh, Jamon Iberico de Bellota, which is a Spanish ham. Make it in Spain from pigs uh, that wander the, the oak savannas of Galicia and other areas of Spain, and they feast on oak, on acorns. So the harvest of the pigs is actually called the, the, the acorn harvest, they also call it the sacrificio, by the way. It's the sacrifice, the harvesting of the pigs, because Catholic culture. And so when they harvest these pigs, they take all of their legs. And this, the genetics of the pigs, the breed, the method of farming and of management of these pigs on these oak savannas is passed down from generation to generation. It is tradition. And they've been doing it this way, uh, actually, uh, since Rome, since the Roman times. And the recipe for this, the finest prosciutto in the world, the likes of which, you can't even get it in this country because the USDA requires that they make a reprehensibly diluted American version for us rather than the actual thing that they, they consume in Spain. Um, the recipe for this finest of hams has three ingredients. It is pig, salt, and thyme. That's it. And there is actually no recipe for this. There is no formula that is written down. And this is part of the virtue of pig killing, I think, is you actually have to wean yourself of the idea of using recipes. Recipes are appealing to us because they have an appearance of scientific and mathematical precision. But that is only true if your ingredients are as constant as numbers, as integers, and they are not. It is only in appearance. There's too much variety, especially if you're using pork that you raise at home. So when you cure the back leg of a pig into jamón in Spain in the traditional method, it's on the salt. They, they, they have these large rooms they layer with shovelfuls of salt on the ground. Then they do a stack of legs, and then they do another several shovelfuls of salt, and then they do another stack of legs, and they build this wall of hams. And they're in there for about 10 to 14 days. 
and I think they get one alteration. They, they change the order of the stack. They take the hams that are on the bottom, they put them on the top. And then they hang them in these enormous rooms. And traditionally, these rooms are temperature controlled, but not by thermostats and humidistats and complex insulation. It's by the opening and closing of the windows at the end of the hall. And these hams stay in there, and there is no set time, there is no recipe for when they are done and ready to be taken down. You actually have to be trained to smell the hams and to determine their ripeness. And so they will train you with a little horse bone because it's porous and it's got a needle shape to it. And so you'll walk up and down as a trained jamon smeller and you will inject the horse bone right next, it's several predetermined points along the ham, right next to the bone, and take it out and you smell it. And you're not just smelling to ensure that it has not putrefied, you're smelling to determine whether or not it's ripe enough to take down and to sell, to carve and to sell, whether or not it's done. So some hams hang for two years, some for five. It's all dependent upon the sensibility of the ham smeller. All of which to say, the Virtue of pig killing involves acquiring these habits of sense rather than the crutch of a recipe. And this is uh, very beneficial when it comes to whole muscle cures, which is what this is. So the curing of whole muscles is actually a very simple thing. Um, salami is a little more difficult. That's where you're grinding meat and fermenting it. That's actually how it preserves. It is fermented. The action of bacteria consuming sugar creates acid and preserves the sausage that way. When it comes to making a whole muscle cure like this, this is the back leg of a pig. This one's a year old. It is actually so simple that when I teach people how to do this, the difficulty is not in getting them to understand the process but in getting people to believe me when I tell them that it is as simple as it is. It's, it's actually very basic. This is the prowess of the home kitchen, not the chefs in lab coats. And so for a prosciutto like this, you would take the fresh leg of a pig off the back and you would cover it in salt, just a nice little layer of salt. And I like to put it in a vessel that has holes in the bottom because what the salt is doing is it's actually pulling water out of the flesh and you want that water to drain away so it's not sitting and soaking in the brine. That's how it becomes excessively salty. And so you're actually draining it away through a perforated container into one that's solid. And then after 11 days, two weeks, you could go ahead and forget about it and it could be 20 days. You come back and ideally this happens in refrigeration where it's rodent and insect free. Rinse off all the salt, dry it, and hang it. And that's it. And then don't, don't touch it for two years. That's the minimum. I, I actually, I did, I grabbed this one at one year. So this is young. This is a young ham right here. Um, and you will find that the benefit of, of doing whole muscle cures is that it is so simple. When, if, if something goes wrong, you will know. So this is, this is the most confident, in, you know, uh, inducing tidbit that I can give you, is that you're never going to wonder if a, if a whole muscle like this has spoiled. You're gonna know. <laughs> Spoilage is very apparent to your nose. <laughs> very apparent. It will smell like putrefying flesh. It will smell like the dumpster on the south side of a restaurant in the middle of July. That's what, it was, that's what it would smell like. You know the smell. You know it deep down. And so you're not gonna wonder about it. So if you cut into your cured meat and you get that, you know, probably don't eat that. Um, I have to say though, I have tested the limits of the reliability of your own native equipment for detecting spoilage. I have gone to the horizon of this and I'm happy to report that you can trust your nose. <laughs> the, uh, I had a friend once bring to me a ham, and he, for some reason, he was in doubt as to whether or not it had spoiled. I could smell him from uh, 30 feet away. 
and he wanted me to test it and see, is this good? And so I knew before I saw him, no, the answer is no, this is not good. And he brought it to me, and it was a little squishy, also not a good sign. You know, because what curing is is drying and removing water, things should get hard and dry. This was not hard. This was squishy. And so I carved into it. And I could not help myself. I felt compelled that I needed to test the message I was getting from my nose and actually try the ham to see if this had indeed spoiled. Has this gone bad? And it actually didn't taste bad, to be honest. So I tried some. But here is the beautiful equipment that we have. I was actually physically incapable of swallowing. Could not swallow the ham. My, 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 somehow my body overrode my brazen and overconfident brain and said, don't swallow this, you moron. <laughs> and, so, and so I didn't. I complied. Uh, but all of that to say, when it comes to whole muscle cures, this is a very simple endeavor. This is remarkably simple, and it's native, the place where it belongs, from which all of our recipes come for cured meat, is the home kitchen. That's where it comes from. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I did bring some prosciutto, some cured meat here that I'd love for you to try. Uh, I'll try to carve some more. But I was able to give you a bit of a, an example of preservation. So this is a, is a one-year-old ham. Uh, this one is, this is also the back leg of a pig without the bone. Uh, this is a ham that I simply didn't cook. So when you use traditional methods, there's actually a vast amount of flexibility in the kitchen. I brined this and I sm cold smoked it intending to cook it, but I didn't get to it on account of the fact that we moved. And so I just shoved it in the back of my truck and hung it here. And when you cure things traditionally, it, it just keeps drying. And so now it's tasty as a thinly sliced ham, not raw, completely uncooked. Uh, not necessarily roasted for like an Easter ham. Uh, so this one is just from uh, last summer. Uh, so is this. This is the front leg of a pig that has been lightly smoked. As you can tell, the, the color has changed. This is a ham. This is the first pigs that I raised on my land in Washington State when we moved there 10 years ago, whenever that was. And this is, sev this is seven years old. And there's some of that there. So if you wanted to try some, I would go from left to right, because if you start all the way on the right, you're not going to taste anything else for a while. It's very rich. It's very rich, very intense, very flavorsome. And you'll find that these are, these are actually the kind of cures that stimulate your appetite, which is perfect for lunch. This is an aperitif. In the Spanish peasant kitchen, the jamón always rests on the mantelpiece, and there's always a ham present. And the head of house always carves some ham before a meal and serves it with some wonderful bread. And that's, that's kind of the beginning of a meal. So uh, with that, I'll end. And uh, if there's any questions, I would, love to, I would love to go there. Even really practical ones. I really only know how to talk about how to do these things. Um, so I would love to go there, but also invite you to try some ham. So thank you. So a lot of people have, uh, like they're hesitant to, uh, to get into this sort of thing because of health concerns, botulism. Yes. Um, could you just speak a little bit on what kind of salt you're using, uh, whether or not we should be worried about using saltpeter, um, and then also maybe some of the legal restraints in maybe selling something like this. Yes. And how to get around it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the legal restraints are significant, and it only matters, yeah, for resale, like you're saying, for retail. So at home, obviously, you can do whatever you want um, for now. In Soviet Russia, it became illegal to harvest your own pig. Pig killing became illegal. Uh, but that would be, if you wanted to go the legal route to be able to sell something that's cured in a traditional method, 
without excessive use of sodium nitrate or sodium nitrate, it is possible. You would need to actually have a, you have to write a HACCP in a variance. You basically have to convince them through much documentation and the scientific rhetoric that they like to hear um, because they don't regard tradition as actual data, which is another problem of our modern era. Um, you, it's possible. Those are like two 30-page documents, and you have to record every batch and prove to them that it meets certain landmarks. And they're going to want to see, you know, okay, without nitrite, are you still getting the pH we want at this particular stage of the cure? It's very tricky. And there's a few, actually, of Benedictine Abbess on Shaw Island in the Puget Sound of Washington State um, who has gone through this battle, but with cheese making. And you might have heard her story, but she happens to also be a biochemist. So she could show the inspectors who wanted her to switch her cheese vat from a, um, a wooden barrel to a stainless steel one. She could show them with charts uh, showing the population of problematic bacteria in her cheese vat why they were wrong about that. We all knew that because uh, we regard tradition as actually a viable source of knowledge, but they don't. And so they, she actually inoculated, when you put, when you make cheese, you put a bunch of milk into a vat and you add your uh, rennet and it precipitates the curd and that's what you strain or compress or age to make cheese. And so she had a barrel and a stainless steel barrel, a wood wine barrel, and it was housing of course, it's so porous, it can't be sterilized. It's full of fungus and bacteria. And then they wanted her to use the stainless vat. She said, okay, we'll use both. And I will actually inoculate both batches with all the bad bacteria, Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli, and track their populations and graph them out for you. And she did that and found that in the, the barrel, the population of the harmful bacteria decreased and went down because it had competition from the other bacteria because all bacteria occurs in an ecology, not in a vacuum. Whereas the stainless vat had no defense against the bad bacteria, so it increased. Anyway, all of that to say, it can be done if you're a biochemist and very holy and, you know, you can take the time, you have to demonstrate it to them. Another Salumi company hired the same scientists that the USDA used to make the regulations to prove to them that they could continue their tradition of back slopping salami. So very difficult, but not impossible. Um, and then when it comes to botulism and curing meat at home, it's really helpful to know what botulism is. It's a toxin that's released from the sp the spore phase of a Clostridium botulinum bacteria. Um, and that only can happen in an anaerobic environment. So absent oxygen, where there's no oxygen. And so all of my curing methods, and, and indeed the tradition of curing, is uh, aerobic. It's in the open air. It's only recently that we start vacuum sealing and shrink wrapping things and using plastic as our means to contain meat where you can get, conceivably, an anaerobic environment and the conditions for botulism. So the, when it comes to whole muscle cures, and by that I mean bacon, prosciutto, hams, um, lomo, lonzo, pancetta, all the itos and the etas of Italian, like all the whole muscle, guanciale, the whole muscles, uh, botulism isn't really possible there unless you're subjecting them to an anaerobic environment where there's no oxygen. Those are all open air, those are all just slabs of meat, you put salt on it, you wipe it off. And then the distinctive flavors from each uh, cure that you make comes from their physiology. They're actually the same ingredients, it's pork plus salt. What makes them different is where they come from on the pig and the constitution of the meat and the fat on the pig in that spot. So the place where uh, botulism is theoretically, and I stress the theoretical part, theoretically possible is in ground meat stuffed into a casing and aged in warm environments, which is what salami is. So that's salami, where you take the flesh of a pig or any animal and you grind it, 
then you salt it and you mix it. You're introducing bacteria to every bit of surface area of that meat possible, which you want to do because you actually need it to ferment. And then you're stuffing it into a casing, which is the small intestine of a pig that is anaerobic. There's no oxygen in there when you stuff it real tight. So that is the particular case wherein they proscribe, indeed require, upon pain of death and the death of all of your family, um, that you use nitrite in that case. Um, I should say, actually, I should preface all of this, anything I say on curing is complete anathema relative to any book written in this country by American authors on curing. So just be forewarned. This is, I'm spouting heresy um, relative to American books written about curing and the textbooks in, in this country. So if you want to break from the puritanical, pure, the, uh, the zealous use of nitrite, get a curing book written in England has the advantage of being European. And so the primary goal of the book is not liability. Uh, and it's in English, which is also an, a language that I read. So it's <laughs> curing books in Britain are great. You'll find a completely different tone. In the United States, the first paragraph is, you're about to embark on the wonderful world of traditional you know, meat curing. If you don't use nitrite, you will kill yourself and everyone you love. Now go for it. That's, that's, that's the way they're written, uh, but not so in Europe. It's, a, it's an optional thing, and it contributes color and a tangy flavor. So if you, unfortunately, this will taste very unique to you because the meat that we buy at the grocery store is all cured with nitrite, even if it says nitrite free. Still got it in there. Um, it homogenizes the flavor of all our cures, and it makes them tangy. And if you were to amplify that flavor of tanginess to 10, it would be metallic. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's not actually bad for you. It's not a carcinogen unless you cook the bacon at a bajillion degrees. Um, it's just homogenizing and it eliminates the conditions for terroir, for the unique expression of your pork because it's just going to make it all tangy. So, yeah. That makes uh, thank sense. you, Brandon. Um, I had a quick question. As you were speaking, especially in your, in all the details, I was reflecting back on when I was hunting growing up with my father and how now as an academic, I'm so distant from creation. I'm so distant from our food sources. And I think many in our culture are. With technology, we can be so far apart. Um, you've actually given us a poetic experience of being united with nature, or at least drawing closer to reality. What would you say to our culture who is and who we are so distant from reality what reasons, I think most people would go to, well, it's healthier, or maybe it, it tastes better, or utilitarian, like what if the food system you know, crashes and you gotta survive, but yeah. what about the virtue in and of itself of, of doing this and drawing closer to nature? Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it, is, it is a natural good. And so I, I think that you know, the, the key to harvesting a pig well, it's, it's, it's more that <laughs> it is still a natural good. So, and I'm always tempted to say, if only, if only you could raise a pig in your backyard in an authentic way. If you can harvest it well and cure it traditionally, you know, these are all Catholic traditions, by the way, all of them. They're all marked by days on the liturgical calendar because people had those days off to harvest their pigs. Um, and so those are all, it's all liturgical. And if you follow all of that and do it, maybe then, maybe then you could find God, which is the point. But it can't do that. You need grace, 100%. And so I think that what this gives you is... Um, it gives you a context that is actually in harmony with the natural order. And that is, that is what I keep coming back to with our family. And insofar as the natural order is worth cooperating with, I mean, it's obviously very utilitarian. If you're coercing everything, which we have the luxury to do with our technology, um, you miss out on a lot. I mean, there's just the pure argument of flavor, which is 
absolutely decisive in my brain. Like you just can't even, it's not even comparable. Uh, so there's that. But the, the reason we would follow, I think the highest and best reason, we would follow the natural order is because of charity. It's because we love the God whose order it is. And that is, so it actually doesn't necessarily, you know, I think you can have your imagination formed in the field and by the farm and that helps you. That is, that is an aid. But in the end, uh, it is actually the grace, the charity of God that helps you harvest the pig well. And if you can actually do pig killing and farming out of love for God, then you have, you've elevated the, the natural order you know, into something more than that, into the life of grace. And um, all, again, by God's doing. And if, if you read, you know, the first epistle of St. John, I think, really fleshes that out. If you, if you read that with that in mind, that in God he is only light, in him there is no darkness at all. And if we walk in the light and he is in, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, you actually get this community. Um, the first step of that is stop sinning against the creator who gave you this order and be in a state of grace. And then you can, you can live in that order in charity as, as, it, was de- as it was designed. Because I've seen many, you know, there's actually a great example of this. Um, many culinary agrarians who evince the virtue of pig killing so perfectly. They've got it. It's beautiful. You know, they, 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 they cook in natural ways. They, they follow the traditions. Their food is indisputably the best ever. You know, they're most in demand all over the world as chefs. But, but, the rest of their life is in complete disarray, absolute disorder and rebellion against God. And uh, so that's why I say if you... You know, it's, it, it's starting to reverse in my mind. It's not so much, if you want to come to know God, learn how to make bacon well. It's more, get on good terms with God. Go to Mass, and then you'll make the best bacon ever. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon, very much. Thank you.